Hi, my name is Tony Sobosinski, and uh, uh, a congregation that my wife grew up in and that had a very big impact on my life was Detroit First Church of the Nazarene. And they are selling, celebrating their uh, uh, 100th anniversary and asking people to share their, our stories with them. Uh, and so this is my story of my uh, experience there with Detroit First Church of the Nazarene. It's not the beginning of my journey. I was uh, brought up in Sunday school and uh, in a Lutheran church. My mother would take me to church. I was confirmed, but after I was confirmed, I just slowly but surely faded away uh, from a relationship with the Lord. And my first love in my life, uh, basically about that same time, I started picking up a guitar when I was 14 years old. By the time uh, uh, I was somewhere around 19 or so, I got asked to uh, audition with a really good group, great guys, uh, called Orange. And uh, I made it into the group, and I just loved uh, playing guitar. Uh, this was a promotional picture we had, Blue Arrow showing who I am there. I look quite a bit different than I did then. But uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your heart set apart Christ as Lord, and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So those are things that we uh, uh, learned throughout the years, and it, it, it all began with uh, Detroit First Church of Nazarene and the Salt Company. I was uh, going to Wayne State University uh, just before I started there at, uh, at the Salt Company. And uh, I, I earned a Bachelor of Arts degree with a major in psychology. But the problem was, was is that while I was going to, to uh, university and earning my major, uh, I was also getting more and more addicted to alcohol and eventually uh, additional drugs too. So my, I took an abnormal psychology class and uh, it's not the exact same list on this uh, graphic here, but on the list that they gave, uh, my friend and I who was sitting next to me, we were kind of laughing, but we checked out eight out of 10 in the stages of being uh, uh, considered alcoholics. The list, I think, was a bit more like this. Problems remembering things you recently said or did, uh, getting drunk on a regular basis. I, I couldn't remember being sober anymore. Lying about how much alcohol you are drinking or hiding it. Thinking that alcohol is necessary to have fun. And uh, I really felt like I couldn't play guitar if I wasn't uh, high. And it really does. Alcoholism starts affecting everyone in your family, in your job, every part of your life. Uh, and we deny it. At Romans 6.21 says, What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. And uh, it even brings me shame now to record this because part of the reason I want to record this too is for my, 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 my family, my grandchildren to see this. I'm definitely not proud of the uh, time in my life when I was drinking way too much alcohol and taking drugs. Uh, and Steve, circled here in orange, was the leader of the group. Uh, he, uh, uh, he was walking across campus towards, uh, I think it was finals week of the last year. We were all graduating the same time I, I had high hopes that we were going to be able to record and we were going to be able to, to tour and, and play regularly as a group for the first time before we had been practicing in the evenings playing locally uh, uh, on weekends. But G, uh, uh, Jesus freaks were people there who were hippies who started becoming followers of Jesus. And I believe they had the four spiritual laws attract on how to share your faith and Steve was walking across campus one of these guys asked him if they could take a moment with him and share something with the pamphlet. He's a nice guy. 
And he did. And it changed his life. Now what had happened with me uh, about the same time as I was offended that my abnormal psychology book was saying that I was an alcoholic. So I decided I'm going to stop drinking for two weeks straight to prove I'm not an alcoholic. And I did. The problem is I started drinking marijuana in, or smoking marijuana in its place and taking some other drugs. When I proved to myself I wasn't an alcoholic, then I started adding on marijuana, drugs, and uh, alcohol. Now at this time, too, you have to remember that, uh, of course, you wouldn't remember if you weren't there, but in 1966, the uh, magazine title uh, uh, on Time magazine is God Dead. And in my experience at Wayne State University, one of my courses, uh, a lady professor challenged Christianity from every dimension, dimension, and she almost gave an altar call at the end and asked and raised her hand up and said, hey, any of you still believe that Jesus, and do you believe in Christianity? Raise your hand. Well, I looked around, no one raised their hand, and frankly, I more related to God being dead. My faith had totally faded. So these Jesus freaks were people who were coming out of a big time of change in the 60s and early 70s, uh, and they were very uh, enthusiastic in serving Jesus and, and sharing their faith. And it's a big movement of, of what we call the Holy Spirit, so that uh, even in our daughter congregation, I've been at the present congregation I've been at now, Concordia Lutheran Church, for almost 20 years. And uh, our daughter congregation started out with a big gymnasium. And during that time, they, they tell me that the entire gymnasium would fill up with, with kids just sitting all over the floor wanting to uh, hear more about Jesus. So what had happened all, all around the same time is that uh, Detroit First Church of the Nazarene uh, had called Pastor Tim Jackson and Pastor Tim Jackson was an entrepreneur and a, a dreamer, a, a, a visionary. And he came up with the idea of having an outreach uh, outside the church, a separate building, they named it the Salt Company, and it would be a way for people who didn't believe in, in Jesus and didn't want to go to church to have a way of uh, bridging back to the church. So it was an entry point outside the church building. At the same time, uh, Time Magazine also recognized the Jesus Revolution at that time. So Steve came to our next uh, meeting uh, and he explained to us that he no longer uh, wanted to play in the group anymore. And I, I, I said, Steve, why? And he said, I, I don't want to play that kind of music anymore. And I said, well, Steve, I think most of the songs we do are just about love. If there are ones that offend you, let's just get rid of them and add different songs. And he insisted, no, I only want to play Jesus music for Jesus. And uh, from my psychology degree, I felt like he was the one who had emotional and mental problems at the time. And I felt like I'm going to be there for him once he comes back around to his senses. So it seemed, I don't know how long the, the times were in a lot of this, but it seems like it was a year that he was inviting me to go to the Salt Company. He said, they got really good music. You'd, you'd love the concert. You should come. And finally, uh, their concert landed on Good Friday. And uh, Good Friday was very special from my the time of my youth because my uh, mother would have us when we were little kids sit in the house and we'd have to play color at the table and be quiet from one to three on Good Friday to recognize uh, and be respectful that during those hours in that afternoon on Good Friday a long time ago, Jesus died on the cross for us. So Steve was saying they're having a concert on a Friday night. 
This time it landed on Good Friday, so finally I decided, yes, I, I, I can go to that this one. And uh, that was from my recollection, March 28th, 1975. So at the Salt Company, they would have uh, uh, musicians come in, and they would be musicians that used to be uh, uh, professionally working in, in the music industry but then they became christians and then they just wanted to sing for jesus and they took tremendous pay cuts to do this and they, they couldn't bring whole groups a lot of times they could just bring one guitar uh, and there weren't that many places for them to play and do a concert just by themselves that first night i went uh randy matthews uh, was the musician uh, and uh, the song that I remember especially him doing uh, uh, was called Didn't He? And the words went like this, and the hammer fell. And he would put his the, the minor chord with his left hand on the guitar and he would pound the wood on his guitar. And that would create the sound of like a hammer falling on a nail and would also ring the chord uh, on the wooden nail through his flesh into the tree as they laughed at him as he cried for them there are more words but the chorus said but didn't he die for you and me and that grabbed my attention and uh in between uh they would have intermissions and this evening they had at the salt gun they had an intermission where uh, Randy took a break, the spotlight went on stage, and there was a, a young man seated at a desk with, and like a news reporter and say, breaking news today in Jerusalem, uh, and then it went to a, a eight millimeter film uh, clip uh, from a graveyard where there were uh, two young uh, women, two young girls, Penny and Brenda, and they were being f filmed looking into an empty grave in our kind of a graveyard. In this picture you see, uh, it shows the kind of a tomb that Jesus was actually buried in. But they were looking over this empty grave with their hands over their mouth shocked. They were supposed to be uh, acting as uh, Mary and Martha from the Bible at the empty tomb of Jesus. And uh, they're, they're what they were to do is once that clip was over the the film would go off they would be standing behind the screen they came from behind the screen and were supposed to go to people and supposed to just dress just like they were at the graveyard and say christ is alive now steve is an extrovert so he brought me right up to the stage and by the time we got into he introduced me to some people the crowd had gotten so thick that I couldn't go back if I wanted to, and either could Penny or Brenda go out into the crowd. It was just too tight. So what they had to do is they had to go back and forth just along the stage to the people they could get to. And Penny accidentally came to me twice, but when she said, Christ is alive, those words, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's almost like everything else disappeared from my mind, and those words christ is alive and bold were put into my mind i believe by god now i wasn't converted that evening and frankly i was very high going to that concert i have to confess a lot of the reason i went back uh, was because i uh, was very attracted to penny but she wouldn't have anything to do with me at that time because uh, she wanted to have relationships with dedicated Christian guys, not people who are non-Christians who, uh, who are on drugs. So anyway, I kept going. Uh, uh, about every Friday, Steve relentlessly would invite me and take me there. I remember one evening in the back uh, talking to a young lady. Uh, she said she was from Iran. She was Persian. And I told her, I said, you know, I really like these people, but I don't think I could ever be like them. She said, that's exactly why I come. I feel the same way. Well, anyway, it was a, 
I know it was in May, and there were sometimes called altar calls or invitations, and and uh, kids were invited to, if they'd like to find out more about Jesus, uh, there were two swinging uh, like doors that you could go through it on each side of the stage, and that would go into a back room in a basement where there would be many people trained in evangelism, and they would lead you to to know what the gospel is and and to pray i didn't ever respond to those but i remember standing out there in that very thick crowd i can almost still envision the the, the lighting it was dark there but somehow the light from the the spotlights that were still on the stage and this might sound like a harmless prayer but for me it's very scary because i really was afraid that god was truly dead and that after this life there is just darkness and nothingness so i was afraid to find out what i believed was true but i breathed a prayer it wasn't even out loud but it was real i said god if you're really out there and jesus is all that these people people say he is show me and all I can say is that by very gradually, it's almost like medicine starting to take effect, my life just started changing. I started losing my desire to go visit my friends. One of the things they loved to do was they would uh, take a big bowl of marijuana, have it on a table, have a fridge just full of beer, and uh, have Syria going on full blast and just sit around drinking, smoking marijuana and uh, listening to music. And you couldn't talk because the music was too loud. And I remember going there. I wanted to see my old friends. But frankly, if you're not smoking marijuana, it's very boring. So I got up to go and said, why where are you going so fast and everything? And they were surprised that I, I wasn't partaking and that, that I wasn't staying. And it reminds me of this passage in 1 Peter chapter 3. You spent enough time in the past doing what unbelievers like to do. You were promiscuous, had sinful desires, got drunk, went to wild parties. All true. Unbelievers insult you now because they are surprised that you no longer join them in the same exoduses of wild living. So my life was just gradually starting to change, not completely, but gradually. Now in July was the next event that I really remember, and what this was is what's called the Salt Festival. And this was outside the Salt Company building, and uh, I don't know how Pastor Tim found some field or place that we could have an outdoor concert with different groups. Big tents would go up and it would be an entire weekend kind of thing. It was uh, in July. So Steve and his girlfriend, Susan, uh, offered to take me to this. So I said, yes. And I remember the hard decision that that uh, I had to choose whether I take drugs with me or just chance that I could stand a whole weekend being sober with all these very religious people. Well, I decided to go sober and leave the drugs behind. I remember being there early because uh, uh, Steve and Susan were working, and I volunteered too once uh, they started their volunteer work. I volunteered to take a big sledgehammer and pound in stakes for putting up the big tents. And I remember taking the sledgehammer and, hammer and I was I was over 200 pounds. I was over six feet tall. I was athletic when I was younger. I even lifted weights. And I was swinging that hammer as hard as I could. And somehow it glanced right off the peg on one of the swings and went directly into my shin on my right leg. And I remember looking at my leg, pulling up my pant leg, and there wasn't a scratch. I didn't feel any pain. I wasn't injured at all. And I believe that's God's way of giving me a sign to say you're at the right place. You should be here and I am here. Anyway, uh, so at the end of that salt festival, Steve and Susan drove me home, left me off in front of my place. And Susan asked me, uh, well, Tony, after this weekend, what do you think? And I 
awkwardly says something, well, I, I liked it. But for me, that meant I was saying out loud that I've made a decision that I do want to be part of this lifestyle in following Jesus as my savior. So that was July and uh, spiritual growth was going on. And by then, well, after the salt festival, I went home and uh, I found my stash of drugs and I flushed it down the toilet and that was the end. So by September, uh, I was becoming pretty serious about the Lord and uh, there was a seminar offered that we could go to, I think it was some like two or three weekends. It is uh, being taught how to share our faith with something called the four spiritual laws. And uh, we were given an assignment that we were supposed to share this booklet with at least three times. It could be with Christians, family, it doesn't matter just to practice before we came back that Saturday. It was a Friday night before that Saturday. I saw Penny at the back because of volunteers, we were working and then getting everything going to, to help everyone else. Almost like being ushers in the back of the church. And I asked Penny, I said, have you done your homework assignment? And she said, no, I said, I haven't either. I said, what do you think if we just walk outside and see if we can find someone who'd listen to us? And she said, sure. So anyway, we, we walked outside the door. And as soon as we got outside, there were four probably high school kids. And they were out there smoking. They didn't want to go into the concert, but apparently they got someone dropped them off there. So I just said, I said, can you guys do me a real big favor? We're taking this class to share our faith. And we have a homework time, time that's due tomorrow to share it three times with people. And you do, it's a real big favor, just let us rehearse this. And I said, sure. All four of them were smoking and uh, started going through, through the four spiritual laws. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And then they continues to they're talking about our sin and how Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, somewhere in there. They started looking very serious. They started putting out their cigarettes with their shoes on the cement. And when it came uh, to the end of that uh, uh, four spiritual laws, we were to ask them, would you like to pray? And all four of them said yes. And we all prayed what's called the sinner's prayer. And they all prayed to receive Jesus into their lives. So that was Penny in my first date. We ended up being married at the First Church of the Nazarene on April 3rd, 1976. This is just a, uh, looks like our wedding invitation where Penny didn't know what she was getting into, but this was so true. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God, from the Book of Ruth. So we were married on April 3rd, 1976. I just found more recently uh, that scholars now believe with confidence that, well, they can't know exactly when Jesus was born, but they can know with certainty that he was crucified on April 3rd of the year of the crucifixion. Well, I'd also been baptized, uh, and this slide shows uh, on the left, I think that's California, just crowds of, of young people being baptized into Jesus. And uh, on the right side, it takes us all the way up to 2011. I've been a pastor since 1980, and uh, it shows me there welcoming uh, several ladies who came to be baptized in the Jordan River in Israel. So that's partly what my beginnings of my Christian life uh, began. And if not for Detroit First Church of the Nazarene and the people who cared, 
They, they cared about Penny. They sent a bus out to pick her up from when she was a child, when her family didn't go to church, and they never did. Uh, they started up the Saul Company to draw people like me who would have never have gone to a church invitation to a worship service, but finally did respond that led me to receiving Jesus as my Savior and Lord uh, through that ministry of the Salt Company, and especially through Pastor Tim Jackson uh, putting that together. And through all these years, uh, in Ephesians 2, 10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And uh, that's what we've been praying that God would lead us to through all these years. So again, we want to thank the congregation from the generations from Detroit First Church in Nazarene. Thank you for caring. Thank you for reaching out to us. And we want to say congratulations on the celebration of your 100th uh, centennial celebration from Tony and Penny Holt Sobosinski. Jesus certainly gives us the abundant life now and forever.